A tire blowout at highway speed gives you three seconds to avoid dying. Three seconds between controlled steering and flipping into oncoming traffic. You drive on four patches of rubber, smaller than your hand connecting two tons of metal to asphalt. You probably check tire pressure once a year, if that. Ignore the warning light. Buy the cheapest replacements when tread runs low. You have no idea what you're trusting your life to. How does milky tree sap become material that grips roads at 80 miles per hour? Why does a tire that costs $40 fail catastrophically while a $200 tire doesn't? And what does sulfur have to do with why rubber bounces? Let's explore the process. Rubber starts as liquid bleeding from trees at 2 in the morning. Not metaphorically, literally. Rubber tappers in Malaysia and Thailand wake at 2 a.m. because that's when latex flows fastest from Hevea brasiliensis trees. The cool night air keeps sap fluid. By noon, heat makes it coagulate too quickly to collect. You're driving on material harvested in darkness by people working against sunrise. You probably think rubber trees grow in tropical Asia. Everyone does. But here's what's actually happening. Every rubber tree in Southeast Asia descended from 70,000 seeds smuggled out of Brazil in 1876. One British explorer broke Brazil's rubber monopoly and shifted the entire industry across the world. That milky latex dripping into collection cups? It's 60% water, 35% rubber polymer, 5% proteins and sugars. Useless as liquid. The transformation happens when tappers add formic acid to collection tanks. Acid makes proteins coagulate, forcing rubber particles to clump together while water separates out. What drips out liquid becomes solid sheets in hours. But raw rubber is terrible material, sticky in heat, brittle in cold, dissolves in gasoline. This is why rubber remained a curiosity for 300 years after Europeans discovered it. Indigenous Amazonians waterproofed fabrics with it, but nobody could make it useful for manufacturing. It melted in summer warehouses, cracked in winter storage. The rubber industry kept failing because the material itself was unstable. Now here's where it gets interesting. In 1839, Charles Goodyear accidentally dropped rubber mixed with sulfur onto a hot stove. Instead of melting, it transformed. Heat activated sulfur atoms that cross-linked between rubber polymer chains, creating bridges that locked the structure. This process, vulcanization, turned useless goo into useful material. You've bought summer tires and winter tires without understanding why the distinction exists. The answer is sulfur content. Summer tires have more sulfur crosslinks, making them rigid at high temperatures for better handling. Winter tires have fewer crosslinks, staying flexible below freezing for traction on ice. You weren't choosing tread patterns. You were choosing molecular architecture. Modern tires blend natural and synthetic rubber, but the ratio determines everything. Natural rubber, from those two AM tree tappings, has irregular polymer chains that absorb impact. This makes it perfect for tire sidewalls, which flex constantly and need fatigue resistance. Synthetic rubber, made from petroleum, has uniform chains that resist heat buildup, perfect for tread experiencing friction. But here's the kicker. During World War II, Japan conquered 90% of rubber plantations in Southeast Asia. America's tire production almost collapsed. The entire war effort depended on rubber we couldn't access. This forced invention of synthetic rubber in 18 months, one of history's greatest crash programs. You've probably bought the cheapest tires. Figured rubber is rubber. 
but cheap tires use more synthetic rubber in sidewalls where natural rubber should go. That's why they develop cracks after three years, while premium tires last seven. You weren't saving money. You were buying molecular compromise. Premium tires also add silica particles between rubber polymers. These particles increase surface area, giving better grip on wet roads. Cheap tires skip silica, using carbon black only. This is why budget tires hydroplane. They literally can't maintain contact with water-covered asphalt at the molecular level. The final step is curing, baking assembled tires at 150 degrees Celsius for 12 minutes. Raw tire assembly is just layers of rubber, steel belts, and fabric cords wrapped around a drum. Useless until heat and pressure in a curing mold activate sulfur, completing vulcanization. The mold also imprints tread patterns, grooves that evacuate water and prevent hydroplaning. Each tire contains about 30 pounds of rubber, 15 pounds of steel, 5 pounds of fabric. 50 pounds of balanced materials rotating thousands of times per minute while supporting weight, absorbing impacts, and maintaining grip. That tire pressure warning you ignore? Underinflated tires flex excessively, generating heat that breaks sulfur crosslinks. Bridges holding everything together start failing. Rubber degrades from inside out. You're driving on molecular failure, waiting for mechanical failure. So, those four contact patches connecting you to the road aren't just rubber. They're tree sap harvested at 2 a.m., cross-linked with sulfur, blended with synthetic polymers, reinforced with steel and fabric, cured under heat and pressure, and engineered at molecular level to grip asphalt while flexing millions of times. Your life depends on chemistry happening correctly in material you never think about. The difference between arriving safely and losing control is measured in sulfur cross-link density and silica particle distribution. And maybe you'll check tire pressure more often now because you're someone who understands what's actually between you and the pavement. That's the process. We reveal how things actually work, one story at a time. If there's something you'd like us to explore next, let us know. Until then, trust the process.